Good morning, everyone. So good to be here. Um, so great to see some new faces that I don't recognize. Um, I think it's been about a couple of months since I was here. And um, the fact that there are new, new faces, um, through, even during that period, is a wonderful testimony. But God is, um, is working very powerfully um, amongst ourselves. So thank you so very much for being here. My name is Kevin. And uh, as Dave explained, I'm the senior minister of the whole parish. And um, please give me an opportunity to say hello to you um, at the end of the service. I'd love to meet you and get to know you. So uh, rather than just uh, leaving us straight away, if you can stick, stick around a little bit, I'll come and say hello to you, OK? Uh, my um, task is now draw your attention to the very final part of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we'll spend the next 20 minutes or so you know, looking, looking through um, this part of the Bible. All right, so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for gathering us here as your people. Thank you for speaking to us. And we now ask you to uh, help us that we might understand, uh, listen carefully, and uh, put, put it into practice what your word is saying to us. And that we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just make a, a one change to uh, the outline that you have? Right at the bottom on the right-hand page, you will see a point C, Jesus' agenda, and then followed by number point three, God with us until the very end of the age. That number three and the, the, what comes after is actually a point, a separate point. So uh, if you can just bring it down to the next line, uh, that'll be really, really good. Okay. Is anyone here planning to change the world or turning it upside down? Well, I'm not because I like uh, things to stay quiet and, and, and just continue on as it is. Um, I notice about that myself. As I get older and older, I don't like changes very much. I like things to stay the same, and I'm sure this is the case with many people, right? I think, in, in fact, the, uh, uh, the pursuit of change is a sign of youth. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. But there were people who turned upside down. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, the Old Testament reading that we did in Jeremiah, when God called the prophet Jeremiah, this is what he said. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. That was Isaiah's task, to go and speak God's word to the, to the nations so that the world might be turned upside down, the things might crumble down and be rebuilt. I don't know if you remember this, but um, when Paul and Silas went to a place called Thessalonica, they were introduced by very angry people or they were accused by these very angry people. And they said, these people have come from, from far foreign land to turn the world upside down. That's how the Christians were, were spoken of, the people who, whose intent was to turn the world upside down. So I ask you again, are you planning to turn the world upside down? Have you done anything recently to, uh, to, to, to turn things around a little bit? Well, I can certainly think of um, certain names, not necessarily Christ, uh, Christians, but certain names that have changed the world, uh, turned it upside down. You think about names like Dr. Martin Luther King or uh, Osama bin Laden. Maybe you can think of a, 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 a philosophical or scientific ideas that turned the world upside down. You know, uh, uh, things like heliocentric model of the solar system. Uh, I had to look it up. To, to work out what that means. You know, in the olden days, people used to think the Earth was the center of the universe and everything else just evolved around it. And then a guy called Copernicus came along, and he was a very clever man, and he said, no, 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 that's, you got it all upside, uh, upside down. It's actually the sun that is the center of the world, and everything else is revolving around it. That's called the heliocentric model of the solar system. What about the, uh, the, the theory of evolution? Well, that, that turned the world upside down, didn't it? You might even think of world events that shook the very foundation of our lives. Think about the coronavirus pandemic. How has that changed the way we live? 
Well, there are things that have reshaped and changed the way we think, the way we live, the way we behave, the way we think, the way we look at the world. But what difference has the gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the message of the resurrected Christ, what difference has that made to your personal life? How has it changed? Has your world been turned upside down? And as you think about the message of Jesus rising from the dead, are you planning to change the world? Well, my aim this morning is to remind you that Jesus' resurrection permanently changes the world and us in a most radically profound and fundamental way. And I'd like to suggest that we need to pause and examine our lives to see whether we have been turned upside down and whether we are planning to turn the world upside down with the gospel. But first things first, we, we need to uh, turn our attention to the passage that was read out to us. So can I have, your, uh, have you uh, have the Bible open to uh, Matthew chapter 28? Uh, it's a short passage, so um, we don't have to uh, spend too much time thinking about it in great details, but there are several things that I'd like to draw your attention to. So let's, um, let's have a look at it. Uh, uh, verse 16 of chapter 28, uh, we are told that Jesus is now at Galilee. Uh, Eleven disciples also went to Galilee. Uh, we realise um, that uh, ever since Jesus entered Jerusalem and uh, began interacting with, with, with the people of, of, of Jerusalem and, and his disciples and as he was killed and then he was, he was buried in the tomb and the angels came, all throughout this period, Galilee gets mentioned several times. In fact, Jesus said to the, the, the disciples uh, during the, the Last Supper, you know, you're going to all desert me and you're, you're going to be scattered, but after I am raised from the dead, I'm going to go to Galilee and I'm expecting you guys to turn up there. When the angels came down from heaven um, uh, at Jesus' resurrection, the women came to the tomb and the angels reminded the, the, the ladies, please, um, go to Galilee and you're going to see Jesus there. Furthermore, Jesus himself once again turned up and said to these two women, please go and tell my brothers that I'm going to go ahead and meet them at Galilee. I think that's one of the most touching moments in, in the whole of the, the Matthew's Gospel. You know, uh, these disciples who insisted that they were going to die rather than deny Jesus, well, they all fled they were betrayers. They, they were cowards. And if I was Jesus, I'd say, well, that's it. Goodbye, guys. Um, you all deserted me. But the risen Jesus turns up and says to these, these two women, tell my brothers, the ones who deserted me, go and tell them that I'm going to go ahead and wait for them in Galilee. So, Galilee um, appears several times in the, in the final part of, of Matthew's Gospel. Well, that's because Galilee was where it all started, remember? Back in chapter 4, verse 12, when Jesus heard the news that John the Baptist had been arrested, he went to Galilee and he began to preach. Galilee was the starting point. So, it's poignant, isn't it, that the risen Christ uh, he's, he's, he's about to restart the ministry and, and get things going again, and he's asking everyone to come back to Galilee. Brand new beginning. But it's not just the, the Galilee was the, the, the birthplace of the ministry that Jesus is asking them to come back there. I think it's actually far more than that. If you look at um, uh, chapter 4, back in chapter 4, which was almost five years ago, uh, you know, it's taken us five years to get to the, the end of Matthew's Gospel. So you work really hard, and uh, thank you so much for sticking with us all this time. But we've made it now, the final part of Matthew's Gospel. Anyway, back in Chapter 4, when explaining how Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, 
Matthew quotes a number of Old Testament verses, mainly from Isaiah, and this is what he wrote. Chapter 4, verse 15, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a great light has dawned. Uh, so according to Matthew, uh, Jesus' choice uh, to begin his ministry in Galilee and not in Jerusalem was kind of a statement of intent. He's making it clear uh, what his ministry is going to be all about, recruiting people, uh, sorry, rescuing people from darkness or from the shadow of death through the preaching of the gospel, and not just to the Jews, but everyone, including the Gentiles foreshadowing the worldwide mission that Dave spoke about. See, the new era has begun. The kingdom of heaven is now open to the people of all race, language and culture. And in case you missed the point, Jesus clearly mandates it in, in verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This is the moment, the promise that God has made to Abraham back in, way back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, many, many thousands of years ago, that moment is about to be accomplished. Remember what, what God said to Abraham? I'm going to bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'm going to curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What a magnificent grand, universal promise this was. You know, after the fall, the Garden of Eden, they were all kicked out and they became under the curse of God. And since that moment, everyone kept on dying. There was a shadow of death cast over the, the entire universe. And ever since then, we were in search of the person who is going to break, break, uh, break this curse and once again bring upon the earth God's abundant which blessing how is it going to going to be done who's going to who's going to accomplish this and it has taken nearly 4000 years before the coming of the lord jesus christ and now the focus is bringing life to the world not just to the jews but to the rest of the world I was going to say, with Jesus' resurrection, a tectonic plate has now shifted. It's fancy of saying significant change has taken place. And if we think about this, even amongst us, we have Australians, we have British, we have Chinese, we have Indians, we even have a Korean like myself. We've all come together, and this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. A reference to the mountain in verse 16 is also highly significant, isn't it? Uh, and there is a number of moments in Matthew's gospel when Jesus was upon a mountain. Uh, you might recall back in chapter 5 that Jesus went up on a mountain to deliver the most famous sermon, the first sermon recorded in, in Matthew's gospel. And the content of Jesus' sermon uh, on that mountain indicated that a new Moses was in town. In chapter 5, verse 29, you might recall this, say these words, you have heard that it was said that the people said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and that anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Or down in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in the heart. What is Jesus doing here? He's not overturning or abolishing the Mosaic law, but he's explaining the true meaning of the spirit of that law. This is not 
no longer the kind of external compliance to the rules and regulations, but Jesus is saying becoming a part of God's kingdom is a matter of heart. You need to stop just being pretending to be moral because you can't be moral anyway, but you need to now stop and think about what is in your heart because God examines the heart and you need a new change, a heart transplant. So Jesus coming, resurrecting, and, and calling upon the nations and changing the world order is not only the kind of worldwide scale, but he's looking at each individual person and saying, you also need to change. You need to stop thinking that you, you can be good enough because you can't, and something radically, fundamentally radical has to change in order for you to become part of God's kingdom. What about these words? He said in verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Um, a famous Russian novelist and one of the most famous Soviet uh, dissidents, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, he was a very outspoken critic of the Russian communism and uh, he once said, Unlimited power in the hands of limited people will always lead to cruelty. That's true, isn't it? Unlimited power in the hands of limited people always leads to cruelty. And that's exactly what happened in, in Russia. Probably that's what's happening in, in lots of other places around the world. That's why in democracy, we're trying very hard to, to disintegrate power and, 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 and spread it around so no one will be having the ultimate power over everything. It's a very dangerous idea. But what is Jesus saying here? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What a radical statement that really is. I mean, unless he's a lunatic. Unless you're a lunatic, you wouldn't say things like this, would you? Unless it is true. And you know, this is not the first time that Jesus says something as radical as this. Back in chapter 11, verse 27, this is what Jesus said. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then notice what he says after that. Straight after he said, Therefore, come to me. All you who are weary and like a burden, and I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourself. My word, yoke is easy, and my burden is light. How radically different is that? Unlimited power in a limited people will always result in cruelty. That is the, the reality of our human, fallen human world, isn't it? And yet Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and therefore come to me. I'm going to give you rest. And what an amazing rest that you and I now enjoy knowing what our future holds, that we now have a, a reason, a purpose to live. There's a certainty of what lies beyond death. What an amazing change that really is. Notice what the rest of the New Testament writers also spoke about Jesus' authority. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hand. Therefore, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. John chapter 2. Or Romans chapter 14, For this very reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both dead and the living. Or Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20, he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked. 
not only in present age, but also in the world to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head of everything for church. Or finally, in, in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore God exalted him at the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory. All authority. Authority to give life, to give judgment, to bring people back to life, to promise the world of the eternal kingdom. All authority in heaven and earth has now been given to Jesus. And we are told that this Jesus has an agenda. Notice there in verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Now, obviously, the most important idea uh, of this, these famous words is to make disciples. That is the agenda of the risen Christ. You might even say that's the reason why he had to go through all this, so that there will be his disciples. Making disciples is what Jesus is on about, and making disciples is therefore what we need to be all about. Now, how does that change or impact the way we think about our lives? Well, many different ways. Now, I grew up um, with my cultural background, my parents, speaking to me again and again and again that I need to be successful, that I need to go ahead. I need to, uh, I need to make a um, name for myself. I'm sure many parents have similar expectations of their children. You know, we, we, we only have one life to live and we want to make it count because we are not 100%, many people are not quite sure what lies beyond and therefore Let's go and do everything we can to enjoy ourselves as much as we can while it lasts. And so we can't think of anything other than enjoying ourselves here by, by making the most amount of money and enjoying the most enjoyable life we can ever imagine. And therefore, job becomes probably the most important thing in, in, in people's lives. You know, we always, when we introduce ourselves to people, we speak about what we do, what our job is. And that's why if you don't, if you don't work, um, for example, if you're a full-time housewife, uh, please stop saying, I'm just a housewife. That is a terrible, terrible way of thinking about the role that God has given you because being a housewife probably is one of the most important things that we can ever think of uh, in the human society. But unless you're a doctor or engineer or a lawyer or whatever it might be, you think your life is not worth it. Well, why is that? That's, that's because that's how you look at the world. Well, what does Jesus say? He say, well, I'm actually on about making disciples. I'd like to see as many people as possible from all nations learning about what I've taught uh, in my earthly ministry by obeying them, by trusting them, and by living a different, a radically different life to become part of God's kingdom. So friends, if that is the case, I'll have to ask you, is making disciples what you are all, are all about? Making Jesus disciples, is that what you're all, all about? Is that why you're living? Is that why you woke up this morning? Or is it why you're planning to do whatever you're planning to do tomorrow? And the answer should be yes. The only reason why I'm here now 
because Jesus has now been given all authority in heaven and on earth, well, that's what I'm going to be about. Notice how it's of all nations once again. Not just the people that I feel comfortable with, that I'm used to or I grew up in, but all nations. There are 7 billion people we were reminded this morning and uh, the vast majority of those people have never heard of these radical change that the risen Christ brings to this world. And we need to be prayerful and we need to re-examine how we are spending our time and our energy and our, our money and whatever it might our, our personal life really needs to turn upside down. We need to reshape, reorganise the things so that we are investing things that we really matter. And that is making Jesus the science. Notice how um, uh, he further explains what it means to make disciples. He, I think he mentions two things here, baptising them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. Now, my thinking is, baptising them in the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded, is one and the same thing. It's just a different way of saying the same things. We might think of the water baptism. There might be some people here who were baptised as a child or baptised as infants. There might be some people here who are, even though they, you, you, you have put your faith in Jesus, but you've never been baptised with, with the water. So you might be thinking, well, what do I do? I haven't been baptised, and does that mean that I can't be Jesus' disciples? And the answer is, of course not. Uh, of, course, of course you can be Jesus' disciples without the water baptism. Because the main idea of baptism here, I think, is not so much being washed with water or sprinkled with, with water, but it's about uh, coming under someone's leadership. Uh, there's a kind of a, a strange um, exp Greek expression uh, here it's more, perhaps it's better to be translated not so much baptised in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but more like baptise them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, a similar expression happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, uh, where the people of Israel, uh, Paul says, were baptised into Moses. It's a strange expression. Uh, I think that's the only, only other place that I can think of in the New Testament where such expression appears. But certainly the people of Israel were not um, okay, baptised in the sense that we are thinking of in the name of Moses. It would be a strange idea to, be, to think of that like that. But I think what Paul is, is saying is the people of Israel came and put themselves in complete trust of Moses' leadership. And that's the way of speaking about baptism. And how do we baptise someone? By teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. It doesn't matter whether you are baptised with water or not. The really important thing is whether you are listening to Jesus' word and taking it really, really seriously. Everything that Jesus has done or taught things in the Sermon on the Mount and everything else. There are five sermons that are recorded in Matthew's Gospel. And we look at all those things and we, we think about it and, and how radically different they are. I mean, Jesus was a radical preacher. And living in obedience to his word in this world is a tough business, isn't it? You know, I recall, uh, you should recall too, when Moses gave the Ten Commandments and all the law to the people of Israel so that they would go into the Promised Land and they would obey those words, living amongst the, the Gentiles, how difficult was that? How, how um, tiring was that? And they kept on failing. It was almost impossible for them to to listen to God's commandments. Well, in one sense, the challenge is also there for us. 
You know, but we are to live a radically different life uh, in the world as followers of Jesus, and it is going to be challenging. It is going to be difficult. And notice what he says here, what Jesus says here. I'm going to be with you to the end of the ages. Yes, I know it's going to be hard, but I promise you that I'm never going to abandon you. What a wonderful way to finish the entire gospel here, because this is how the gospel started, remember? Uh, when the angel came to, to Mary and told the birth of Jesus, he said, well, his name's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And finally, Jesus, after his resurrection, says, because of the resurrection, now I am able to stay with you for the rest of your life, as you live your life in a radically different way, obeying all that I have commanded. So take heart. Friends, um, uh, how does the Jesus resurrection change everything that we, uh, everything in our lives? Well, in the most profound way, most fundamental way. It changes the purpose. It changes our destination. It changes the way we operate now as we struggle to obey Jesus' words. Um, during the week, I was up in the mountains and I thought I'd spend some time thinking about, well, where we are going as a parish. What should we be on about? And one of the things that I, I have to really remind myself once again was the importance of thinking about our youth ministry, our children's ministry. It is so wonderful to see children here. Um, and when I went up to uh, the youth camp a couple of weeks ago, and there were some high school kids from our Enfield congregation as well. And I was thinking about all this. I was thinking, how wonderful will it be if some children here, 10 years down the track, would come up and say, you know what, um, being a doctor is wonderful, but I'm not going to do that. I think making Jesus known and uh, making people of his disciples is even more important. So I'm going to let everything else go and I'm going to go and be in a vocational ministry. How wonderful would that be? Or even better still, some, some of them might say, yeah, I'm going to do that actually, but but I'm actually going to do it over, over, over in China or, or in Indonesia. Have you ever thought about that? That our children might get up and say, well, I'm going to take Jesus' word really, really seriously, and that's what I'm going to be doing. Not that you have to go overseas or become ministers to, to take the word seriously, but making that sort of decision is a clear indication that the person takes words of Jesus really, really seriously, right? And I started praying for that. And it is my hope and prayer that the you, in, in praying for your children, will also say, yes, how wonderful will it be if my child, our children, grow up understanding that there is nothing more important than making Jesus known for the rest of the world. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the whole of Matthew's series. I thank you that Jesus has risen from the dead and he has brought a new era uh, into this world. Thank you, Father, that, that we can no longer live the way uh, of this world. We pray, Father, for the change of our hearts, our thinking, that we might radically follow Christ. Please help us to understand that there is nothing more important than making Christ known. There are many people amongst us uh, in our community who are perishing away without knowing Christ. So, Father, please use us and use our parish, our ministry, as your instrument in making him known. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.